Good morning. Uh, I'm Dennis Lim, member of the Festival Selection Committee. We have with us today for the press conference the director of the film, uh, as well as the star of the film. They've worked together on four features and I think have gone on to become one of the great actor-director partnerships of our time. Please welcome James Gray and Joaquin Phoenix. Hello. Uh, do, I I have, do I really have to wear this? No, <laughs> you can take it off. Uh, Keep it on. <laughs> I'll, start, uh, I'll start with a few questions. Um, first one for, for James. Um, five films into your career, two decades into your career. This, this film represents several firsts for you. Um, perhaps the most notable one in that it's not just about um, a female protagonist, but told from a, a female point of view. Um, can you talk about that decision? Uh, why a woman, why a female point of view for this particular story? Um, I had seen uh, in, I think it was 2008 or nine. I can't remember now, I had seen a performance of uh, an opera called Il Tritico, which is by Puccini uh, in LA. The two tra it's, a tr it's a triptych. The two tragedies were directed by uh, William Friedkin and the comedy was directed by Woody Allen. The, th the middle one was uh, called Sor Angelica, and uh, it was told from the female perspective. And I spent the better part of the 60 minutes of the operetta weeping. And I realized, or I thought, that there was something extremely beautiful about exploring uh, melodrama from a uh, female, pr female protagonist's perspective, because all of a sudden, I would be free from the constraints of what I might call macho posturing, male behavior, all that stuff, and get straight to the emotional heart of it. And I, I don't mean that, you know, women are more emotional. That's not what I mean. What I mean is culturally we say masculine and feminine, we, the, the traits that we assign to those qualities, those, those words. Uh, and I just thought I could cut out all of the trappings of male behavior and just try to explore the emotion of it and to do something very operatic. Not melodramatic, but a melodrama. So that was really the inspiration for it, and uh, I found it quite rewarding, actually, and liberating. I know you've, you've drawn on uh, autobiography, or this autobiographical elements in your other films. Can you talk about the ways in which you did that for The Immigrant? Well, the movie is uh, a strange combination of the Puccini operetta that I just talked about, and family stories uh, that had been told to me really from the beginning. I have, my grandparents came through uh, Ellis Island in 1923, and their entire history was quite well documented. We had all the paperwork and so forth. The, great, the name was uh, Greit, Greitschestein, uh, and was shortened, they shortened it to Gray. By the way, it's, not, it's a bit apocryphal, you know, this idea that the, the, uh, the customs guy would change the names. That would never happen. The people themselves would change the names out of embarrassment. My grandparents told me all these stories, of course, you know, the, we didn't know what a banana was. We ate it like, you know, we just bit into it, and of course that wound up in the movie. All those sorts of details, but what was really kind of an interesting thing for me was that it was not like the typical immigration story. You know, when I saw movies about the American dream, they always seemed to me like, I came to America, and it was fantastic, and I loved it. <laughs> and the truth is, is that my grandparents spoke really no English till the day they died didn't really assimilate at all, and there was a tremendous melancholy to especially my grandfather, who used to talk about how he missed the old country, which I never understood. I mean, he was, uh, my grandmother's parents were beheaded by Cossacks, so I, nev I never understood what he was missing, really. But uh, I found it interesting that he, had, he still had this pull for this place, and to me, it meant that the immigration experience was a bit more complicated than America's great. So that was one of the th moods that I was trying to impart. And so many of the stories about, you know, my grandmother telling my father to, to me, translating to me about the trip on the boat and how dirty it was and how the men were very aggressive with the women and all that stuff wound up in the film. And I just tried to bring that mood to the movie, and my, my grandparents, by the way, do make a cameo appearance in the film. And she has this little locket, and the left side is her sister, the actress, the right side is my grandparents. So in a way, you could almost look at this film as a 
providing a historical or genealogical context for your other films, which deal with immigrant families and yeah. ethnic families in outer borough New York for the most part. You know, I, I, I had never thought about that, Dennis, at all. And then when I started showing the film, people were like, oh yeah, it's like a prequel. And then it it's becomes very obvious. But I, it was not a conscious thing at all. Could you, uh, maybe Joaquin, you can weigh in. I'd like to hear you both since Probably you worked. Uh, well, <laughs> if you feel like it, you, you could. Um, but it's, you've worked together since The Yards. Uh, was the process any different this time, given that it was uh, in some ways a different type of film? Uh, you can answer that. Was it different? Yeah, I, I mean, I'd, I'd love to answer that. Um, I, I just, <laughs> I, I don't know how it was different. I mean, I think every film is, I like this isn't working, is it? Oh, you get real close. Oh. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, every film is different. I, I really don't, I don't remember. I'd love to give you examples of how it was different, but I, I, I can't think of anything in, in particular. So untrue, you were such a different actor now than you were then. Maybe that's true, James. Um, <laughs> but I, 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 I'm just not aware of how, how so. Why don't you point out? But thank you for your interest and for the question. Well, I can say that Joaquin has taught me a very valuable lesson, which is to be very uh, uh, process-oriented, we were just talking about this, but process-oriented, like not to think about result, but to enjoy the doing of it, which uh, is not so easy when you're in a narcissistic position like directing, you know? It's a very egotistical, narcissistic thing. And uh, I've learned a lot of lessons from him. I think that I, I've sort of, that's one of the things that was, that's changed at least, I think. I, yeah, that's, you don't see that at all? That was well said, James. Oh. <laughs> What's the point? I'll, I'll ask one more question before we, we open it up. Um, maybe could you, no. Did you, have, did you, maybe you could both talk about um, the process of research. Uh, it's uh, very detailed uh, for um, a period piece, even though I know you didn't make it with a huge budget. Uh, can you talk about reference points that you used? Um, I don't know, Joaquin, if you, there were any reference points that you used for your character, um, it seems like the photography of the period might have been, might have informed the look of the film for one thing. Well, the photography of the film was all based on uh, two things really. It was based on these things called autochromes, which are, they're sort of like f fake color f photographs. They're sort of the, they use di hand dyes, on, they dye them by hand on glass and they basically make it look like color. They, these were a series of photo types of photographs they took about 1905 to about 1920. Uh, so the look of the film is based on that. It's also based on, you know, it's all this, th everyone says to me, oh, it's like uh, Vilmo Zygmunt and Gordon Willis and all that. But the truth is, is that it, it just came from two things. One is the huge amount of soot, coal, all that stuff burned in the air, basically cut the light and always made it kind of a yellowish thing as opposed to bright blue skies. Huge amount of pollution. And the other thing was, you know, when you light things by gaslight, they take on a kind of yellow ochre hue. So you could light it a different way with fluorescence, but it would be totally ahistorical. You know, I was very obsessed with trying to get the details right because in candor, you know, I had made another film which I think I used a television commercial that was two years out of date or something from, you know, two years earlier or something. And I got raked over the coals for it by friends and, and, and critics alike. And I thought, I mean, I have uh, these friends from New York said, that commercial didn't play anymore after 1989. What are you doing? So I became, on this movie, I was like, I'm not going to make that mistake. And of course, there's tons of mistakes, I'm sure, anyway. And I'm sure there'll be some IMDb goofs thing, you know, about how I didn't get something right. But uh, yeah, we, we I know, I, I, not just the stories from my own family, but certainly uh, Luc Sant's book, Low Life, was a big influence. And um, uh, I spent a lot of time talking to the librarian at Ellis Island. He became my best friend, you know. And we tried to get the Enrico Caruso concert as accurate as we could, you know, based on all the stuff that I had gone through in the archives there. And it's, it's really a, a big challenge, but you have to do it in order to sustain the, you know, the suspension of disbelief, you know. And in terms of the actors, did you show them anything, have them read anything? 
I, I, try, I, did, I, did go, I did have a 1912 prostitution manual, which I based all your dialogue on, like Lady Astor, all that is based on actual stuff that I had gone through. But I don't know how much you, I think you just made it very personal. I don't know about research. Ricketts. What? Ricketts. <laughs> I became obsessed with Ricketts, but it didn't really have a place in the film. I kept trying to get it in. That was the only thing that I wanted, <laughs> but it just wouldn't work. And that was about all the research I did. Uh, you learn something new every day. We actually talked about it a number of times. Rickets? Yeah. Well, I, we talked about uh, afflictions. I mean, in a way, I, saw, I, I think we softened it really quite a bit yeah. because the truth is, is that actual tenement life was worthless. I mean, the, ac the tenement that we built, which is a, based on, the, of course, the tenements of the day, and you can see them at the Tenement Museum on Orchard Street, which is just great, was much, much smaller than where we shot because, which was on the stage, we built it, because if it were the same size, we wouldn't put the crew and the camera in there. So I had to make that a little larger. I mean, the tenements were ripe with, with vermin. Uh, everybody had typhus, basically. So there was a lot of, I didn't, I decided that I didn't want the movie to be about that, you know? It's not, a, it's not an anthropological study. All right, we'll take some questions. Uh, yeah, let's start in the back. Towards the back, yes. Uh, James will take some questions now. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> He's so smart and brilliant, and he doesn't want to talk. Yeah, it's a question to James, actually. Um, I'm Polish, and uh, I love the movie. I love the Thank performances. You. And uh, Sorry, could you speak up a little? Thank yes, sure. Now, is it better? Or is it not working? Uh, my CBGB Hello? days are going to hurt me here, but let's try. <laughs> so, maybe I will try like this. No? <laughs> okay, so starting from the beginning, I'm Polish and I love the movie, uh, I love the performances, um, Marion Cotillard's parts, speaking in Polish including. Uh, I just wanted to ask you um, to know about, uh, a little bit more about the process of uh, casting her and whether you considered maybe um, casting some Polish actress to the main role. Thank you. Well, the other actors, I mean, the, the woman who plays her aunt is Paul. I, well, I, let, me, let me, I'll try and answer it this way. Um, I, w I have three young children, and I kind of stopped going to the movies in about 2006. I mean, I see them at the end of the year, some. But I'm, I'm a little bit out of touch with movies right now, and I didn't know who Marion Cotillard was. And I, I had become friendly with her boyfriend, and we went out to dinner in Paris, and I met her, and she and I started arguing about an actor whom she loved and I thought was overrated, and she threw a piece of bread at my head. <laughs> and I immediately, of course, you know, when she mentioned that she thought I was a jerk, I, of course, immediately liked her as a result. And I thought she had a great face, you know, not just physically beautiful, which she is, but uh, a haunted quality almost, like a silent film actress. I mean, I've talked about this, but she reminded me of uh, Falconetti from the Dreyer film. Uh, very uh, able to convey uh, depth of emotion without dialogue specifically. So I wrote the movie for her and for Joaquin. And if they hadn't wanted to do the movie, I'm not, I, I mean this, I'm not sure I would have made it. She, uh, the, whether she was Polish or French didn't really affect the decision at all, although she wound up cursing me because she would be on the set, as you can remember, she'd have her little book of Polish like this. And she was really stressing about getting it right. But uh, I didn't think about that at all. I just wanted to, uh, it's like I say, that the, the try and reaching back in a way to move forward, to try and uh, reference, in a, uh, in a sense, the silent film, the depth of those beautiful silent films where the actor either didn't have to say anything or it, what I think is a beautiful quality in movies where an actress says, you know, or one person says to the other, you know, I like your shoes, but really it means I love you, you know what I mean? Or I, I want to kill you. In other words, that subtext is everything. So I felt that her face was uh, able to do that, you know, was, was able to convey great meaning and emotional depth. She's very intelligent, and she's very, um, you know, intuitive that way, and I, I loved working with her. She's one of the, my favorite people uh, to work with. And with Joaquin, I just, you know, I'd worked with him before, and I think he's, uh, close your ears, fantastic. So, all right, I'll stop. I actually do like your shoes. They're kind of cool. You get away with it. If I wore them, I'd look like, you know, a member of the Hasids or something. 
Uh, actually, let me, can I just ask a, a, a quick follow-up to that question? Um, your, your background is, your, your grandparents emigrated from, is it Russia or the Ukraine? The, on one side, from a town called Ost Ostra Ostropov, I think it is, right. uh, pronounced. It's gone now. It was mostly destroyed by the Tsars and then totally leveled by the Nazis. That's about apparently about 25 miles outside of Kiev. Right. That's on my father's side. On my mother's side, they're Polish. Right, okay. So, but um, Ru Russian Jewish background is sort of your family. Uh, yes. But can you talk about the significance of making this character Polish and Catholic? It started f because uh, in the pure historical sense, the Polish uh, immigrants at the time were Catholic, and I started to see that, and you know, m some people might regard as a mistake, I don't know. I, I find that uh, I made her Catholic because of the theme of the film, or one of the themes of the film that I wanted to explore, which is this idea of redemption and forgiveness which is almost institutionalized in a way in the Catholic Church and the idea of, you know, of course Madonna Whore, the, all of this stuff was connected to uh, the Catholic tradition. Uh, the Jewish tradition is a, is a little bit different so um, really it comes from what I wanted the film to be about. You know, I wanted her almost to kind of uh, baptize him at the end, you know, to uh, kind of, um, I wanted the film to be a really a kind of a about about this idea of uh, no one is beneath us. Nothing, you know, everything is of value, which is a very, I say, Fran Franciscan idea, you know. So all of this seemed consistent with making her Catholic. And I also, last but certainly not least, it would make her even an outsider on the Lower East Side. So it would put her totally in that position. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I was wondering if, in um, writing the script, if you thought about dramatizing their crossing and also having more scenes between uh, Marion Cotillard and her sister earlier on before they arrive at Ellis Island, you know, at uh, the script stage. So. Yeah, I mean, very early on, maybe, but at a certain point, you have to make key decisions unless the film is going to be three hours or something. Um, I, I came at it because there are very few films, believe it or not, which, well, so I couldn't actually think of any films shot at the actual Ellis Island for what it was. There are a couple like America, America, and The Godfather Part Two, which have Ellis Island in them, uh, which, of course, they weren't shot at Ellis Island. But uh, I, I never thought the actual drama of the crossing, which is depicted in America, America, the Kazan film from 1960. I don't know if you're familiar with that movie. It's sort of done perfectly in that movie. Uh, and I just felt uh, that the story wasn't about their relationship, that a sis sister's relationship is already a kind of built-in love, and I wanted to explore something else, which was about this kind of you know, the idea of codependent, a codependent relationship, which is a very post-war kind of concept, from, really from Alcoholics Anonymous. But I wanted to apply it to a period setting, a codependent relationship between a man and a woman. So I didn't really think about the sister's story so much. To me, that was only the, 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 co the cause of the, her dilemma, not really something to explore. I, I hope that answers your question. Yep. Yes. Uh, well, do I have to stand or can I sit and ask it? <laughs> All right. Um, your film has that kind of warm feeling, like a new Hollywood film or like a 70s film. Like, was it shot on 35 millimeter? And do you have really strong feelings on shooting on film versus shooting digitally? The, the decision about digital or film is going to be made for us, you know? Uh, I think the answer is film is going to be gone. Although I think it'll make a comeback. It'll be like vinyl records or something. But um, the movie was shot on 35 millimeter film. What we did do was, D Dalius Kanji and I, the cinematographer and I, we did, we did tests on Alexa, Red, Kodak, and Fuji. Fuji doesn't even make film anymore, by the way. And I filmed them out and I did them blind. You know, we just 
screened them and said, well, which one is the best? And it, I, to my mind, screening them blind, it wasn't close, that the Kodak looked incredible. But I think it's the power of what is new that is uh, really very, in some ways, damaging. Because if you say, okay, I have, let's say everybody shot in digital. The whole world were digital. There weren't Steven Spielberg and Chris Nolan, all those guys, they were, they were all shooting digital. And all of a sudden, I came out with a new product, and I said, well, there's this thing. It doesn't see in pixels. It sees in grain, which is more like your eye sees, and has better contrast ratio than digital, and it has better representation of color than digital, and the blacks are better. You know, if I, 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 everyone would be like, this new thing, film, I got I to gotta change to film. <laughs> because I can't understand why everyone wants to migrate to a medium that is, in my mind, objectively worse. It's not even cheaper, really, digital. Now, there are some advantages. I think it comes from cinematographers being fearful. Because what happens is, is that on digital, you see exactly what you're getting from the monitor. And so there's no evening of terror. I remember Dalius's reaction when we did all this stuff in the, in the, in the sewer s system where it, Joaquin and Mariana are being chased by the police. That night, Dalius was like, oh, I don't know. I I did all that, and I don't know what you're going to see, and it's really, it's really, I don't know. And he's, you can tell he had a sleepless night worrying about the lab and all that. And that's gone with digital. But the audience doesn't care about that. The audience sees the movie. They don't care about the sleepless night that you had, not wor you know, worrying about whether the thing would be developed or whether there would be an image. So I just, and, and you mentioned the new Hollywood thing. Well, to me, that was a wonderful period in American cinema where, uh, there was a kind of honesty uh, and a directness to the emotional life of these characters. You know, and I think that there are many filmmakers today who work in a very uh, admirable way. But if you look at the studio system, it certainly represented a kind of a peak. I mean, there's, it's not just me that's saying this. I mean, there's 1939 19, to 1941, and then there's 1967 to about 1974, 75. So those are the periods that have inspired me, but I'm not alone. I mean, every filmmaker I know who I'm friends with, it's a contemporary of mine, would obsessed over those movies. Yeah. Um, James, the, the Jeremy Renner's character, Arlando slash Emil, he's the one character in the movie who really explicitly mentions the American dream, he sort of promises escape. And he is a professional illusionist. And I was wondering if you could talk about the significance of that. You just made it so obvious that I can't, I, how can I respond to that? <laughs> the character came from when I had read about the show on Ellis Island that Caruso sang that he had acts opening for him, one of which, which was a magician. And his character is based on a real guy named Ted Anneman, for whom he is literally the spitting image. Uh, and I just found that, uh, that, you know, magic was very important in the early 20s. I mean, it was uh, the age of Houdini, but even before, you know, before Houdini, mm -hmm. other did a lot of magicians. It was the magic and the occult, you know, as a way of uh, explaining the unexplainable. So. Uh, it was, that was part of the history of it, but then it did have, I thought, a thematic tie, and I can't answer that now. You basically said it. <laughs> yes. The mic's coming. Bruno's business are the desperate. And at the beginning, uh, there wasn't much of a soul that was visible. And um, then I felt the journey that we go through uh, throughout the film with, um, with Ava is finding glimpses of the soul in Bruno and in others, in the business of the desperate. Is that something that you would say is what you were doing? Um, well, I can say that we sort of engineered the movie a bit. In, I, 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 I know that we talked about this. I certainly engineered the movie on a script level in reverse. 
my co-writer, a wonderful guy named Rick Manello, who's, who's now dead, unfortunately, tragically, uh, he and I talked about the, the ending first and how that would inform everything, that ultimately it was more about the ending made the story in a way about him as much as it was, if not more, than about her because he, in, uh, in a way, is forced to confront uh, certain his self-loathing and to come to grips with the fact that just to survive is its own form of heroism. Uh, certainly it was back then. It is today, I think. I mean, life is very hard. You know, people will say to me, oh, you're a movie director. What's hard about your life? It's like everybody's life is hard. Everybody lives uh, in the, with great challenges. And uh, my whole uh, journey to attempt to express was that in order to survive, he had to do these things. And I didn't want to, as horrible as they are, I didn't want to judge him for it. And that in the end, that we saw th through this self-hatred some kind of deliverance. I, I know this is not making any sense. I, the, the way that you try to write these things is to come from a very emotional place. It's not a, a verbal or intellectual one. So you try to think thematically as much as you can, but uh, in the end, it's trying to communicate almost the unfathomable, almost the, 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 the kind of nonverbal mysterious. And with that character, I felt a close kinship. You know, uh, obviously, <laughs> I'm not a, a, a pimp in the Lower East Side, but, and thank God my wife has not yet arrived in New York. But uh, <laughs> what, I, what I can say is that uh, I did empathize with his self loathing and his struggle to survive, his struggle to battle. In my case, depression, but certainly a struggle to battle the difficulties of of living. I, I don't know. Can you you want to elaborate? Sounds really good. Does it? Because I felt it was gibberish. I mean, I meant it, but it was gibberish. That's the sad part. I think we have time for one last question. Yes. Do you want to, do you really want to go to the front row? Okay, we'll do that. <laughs> um, all right, but there's um, there are two hands in the front row. Here. Thank you, thank you, Dennis, and thank you, Joaquin. Um, this is a question for you, actually. We've seen you do a number of impersonations here of character studies, if you will. So. With that, I ask you basically three questions. First of all, when you write, do you hear your characters speaking to you in your head? Secondly, do you ever intend to act yourself? And thirdly, when you're explaining what you want to actors, do you ever act for them? <laughs> I can answer those. <laughs> you, you, go ahead. No, that's true, but I, I, I will answer the... Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm the worst actor ever. Um, I, I, had, I had two chances to act in my life. The first was uh, Wes Anderson wanted me to be in The Life Aquatic, and he said, uh, no, it's really fun. You come, it'll be, uh, we'll be in Rome, it'll be amazing. So I said, what do you mean, Wes? How long? He said, he said, uh, two, three weeks, and I'm thinking, no way, right? No way, two or three weeks. And I, I didn't understand why he wanted to cast me, but I don't know, he's a friend, and as a consequence, probably wanted some form of revenge. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and so I said, okay, and then we were gonna go, and then all of a sudden I got the, the schedule, and it was, you know, five months at Chinichita, you know, and I could just see, you know, mental illness creeping in, and. Uh, uh, so I said no, and he said, "What are you time? It's in Rome. You gotta come. It's gonna be Rome." I said, "Yeah, but five months in Rome," and all of a sudden I felt like Rupert Pupkin. You know, six weeks. I can't give you the six weeks. Anyway, um, I'm glad some of you got that. Some jokes are just for me, you see. Um, so I, that was the one chance. Then the second chance I had was I, I acted in a friend of mine's movie called Love Jones, and I had a scene with Lorenz Tate. Uh, 
And if you see Love Jones, I'm not in the movie. So that should, <laughs> that should tell you how good I was. It's called Cutting Room Floor. But I do love actors, and uh, as a consequence of, of my ineptitude, I realize how difficult that it is. And I, I get angry at friends of mine when they say, so-and-so was just playing himself. You know, I, I really love James Caan's performance in The Godfather as Sonny Corleone, and I've heard people say, oh, he's just playing himself, which A, is not true, I know Jimmy Caan very well, and B, even if that were the case, that would be the best thing you could possibly do. Like, removing the wall between actor and character, removing the wall between character and story, character and spectator. That, that is a great thing, and I do not have that talent at all. So, of course, I'm probably, as all directors are, frustrated actor, and I like to act like I'm better than they are, and of course I'm significantly less skilled. So, uh, how do I work with the actors? I don't know, that's a question you would an answer, I don't know. You, that, or, or actually, obviously, not answer, but... <laughs> what's the point? All right, so... Uh, <laughs> no, but he does give, he, he, he's actually a good mime, and he will do... I'm right, right, right. I don't <laughs> And he will, after a couple of weeks, he will start like, do, doing lines, so try and say it like your character. And it's really funny, it's actually really good. That's terrible, I give you line readings? No, but you'll just start talking about things. You, you will just talk about a scene, and you'll start trying to talk like the character when explaining the scene, and it's really funny. <laughs> <laughs> That's not conscious. I mean, here's the thing, all, in a way, uh, all uh, writing is almost a kind of form of method because you have, to, you have to live the person that you're writing. And what you find is that whenever I give the script to friends of mine who, you know, for feedback before I shoot and, you know, tell me what you think, if, if I haven't done that sort of weird living it for that person, even if it's a smaller role, uh, inevitably the f friend of mine will go, yeah, that character, that's not good, you didn't, you didn't think about that guy. You can never hide from that. So, yeah, I try to, I try to think it as much as possible and <laughs> hope for the best. Uh, that's all we have time for. Thank you for coming, and thank you, Joaquin and James. Thank for being you. Here.